Um, Shannon's going to sing a song here in, in just a moment. It's off of one of her CDs. I think it's, it's this, this one, isn't it? Yeah. Emmanuel. We are starting our series through December now that we're calling The Presence. Obviously, the focus is the presence of Jesus. I just got the title for the, the Christmas Eve me uh, message when Shannon was praying about how we look for the perfect present. And so the title on Christmas Eve for you to invite your friends to is the perfect presence. The perfect presence. And that's, what, who do you think that might be about? Christmas Eve. It's about Jesus. He is the perfect present and the perfect presence. But she's going to share a song in a minute. But I'm going to do something with you right now for just a, a few moments. That Saturday night, I put it kind of at the end of the message. But I think it's more appropriate to start this way. I want to talk to you about seizing this season. How many of you, the season kind of seizes you? And you get caught up in just all of the flow of all of that busyness. And Christmas is over and you never really took time to kind of seize that season and kind of savor in it, simmer in it. All these S words. It sounds like the preacher prepared this, but I didn't. But we're just kind of, you know, lingering in the moment of this remarkable season where we pause every year unapologetically. We, we're pausing in our David series and we're just going to look at, from different angles, this focus of His presence here among us. And the, the, the title of the song she's going to sing, Emmanuel, is all about that. God is with us. But I want to give you some tips on how to make this more than just a crazy, another crazy, busy season. If you want to take notes on this, you can. Read the story again. Read it slowly. Read it carefully. When you get done reading it in the translation you typically read from, get another translation. You can go online and read them all for free. If you don't have a computer, you can sell your horse and buggy and buy a small computer and, or go to a friend. And I know that was bad. But, um, but read it and pay attention to Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapter 1 and 2, and the Gospel of John chapter 1 that we'll be looking at this morning in our message. But just saturate yourself in the story. The second thing, listen to the music. How many of you love Christmas music? I don't care when it starts. I don't care if it would go all year long. Some Christmas music I just can't get enough of. I, I did a little bit of a, of a survey on Instagram and Facebook this, this uh, last week. And I asked people to uh, tell me your favorite Christmas songs, whether they're traditional or contemporary. And I mean, all the traditional ones came flooding in. Joy to the world and O Come All Ye Faithful, the Latin form of that, Adeste Fidelis. One of my favorites is the um, In the Bleak Midwinter and Good King Wenceslas. All of those made the list. But what I did is I made a Christmas playlist for you. There's a stack here on either side of the stage and there's another little stack I think still at the info counter and these are the more contemporary ones. Some great new music is coming out. I just love the fact that people that look again at this story come up with new ways of celebrating it in song. I, I, I think one of my absolute favorite of the, uh, of the newer ones by Chris Rice is Welcome to Our World. It's just such a powerful, beautiful song. Mary Did You Know made the list about 15 times. And all, oh, how many like Mary Did You Know? Oh, go ahead, say it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. So um, pick up the Christmas playlist if you'd like it, and uh, maybe that'll help you. Seize the season by going and seeing the lights. This is best done after dark. It doesn't make a lot of sense to look at the, the lights in the middle of the day, although on a day like this, some of them would show up. But as you walk around with your family, maybe it's Newport Harbor, you can walk around all those channels there and the lights are just really done up and, and maybe it's a Christmas tree lane near you. Talk to your kids especially. Remind yourself too that every one of those lights that gets lit at Christmas time is because of the light of the world that came here. And remind your kids about every light that's on your tree and every light that's around the bushes and wherever they are, the lights that you light up on your desk especially because, because you're reminding yourself the light of the world came here among us. So Go see the lights, light some of your own, give. Give groceries and toys and clothing and blankets, maybe a neighborhood food drive, but be generous this Christmas for those, with those that maybe don't have as much as you have and they may have a great need. Be generous in giving that way. Throw a Christmas party. Maybe it's casual, formal, maybe completely impromptu. The end of work, hey, hey, let's go have a party tonight and just you know, see what happens with something as spontaneous as that. You sing, you eat, you rejoice, maybe a $5 gift exchange, and you just linger and somebody prays and you remember the reason that you're celebrating because the gifts were given to you. Write a new Christmas story. That's your story. What How many of you would say that the coming of Jesus has made a difference in your life? 
Why don't you tell someone your own Advent story, your own um, story about how the coming of Jesus, the appearance of Jesus, his arrival in your life has made a huge difference. And I've even given you a title. Do you like that? It's Joy to My World. The joy that he brought to my world. Uh, invite. Invite friends and family and neighbors and teammates and co-workers and the boss to Christmas Eve to hear about the perfect presence. So get busy doing that and invite people to come with you. You can certainly invite them to come before uh, Christmas Eve comes along. How many of you are here, by the way, because somebody invited you to come along with them to refuge? Let me see the hands of those. Maybe it's not your first time. Maybe you've been here 10 years, but you came because a friend said, you've got to come. Any more? Any more? Do that. You know, be that connection point for your friends and your family. And eat responsibly this, se this season, okay? As you seize the season, eat responsibly. But eat the cookies, gluten-free if you want, fudge, sugar-free, tamales and pozole. Absolutely not Christmas without those. If you, if, if you have more tamales than you know what to do with, I will give you my address and you can mail them to our house and I'll help you deal with the overage, okay? I'm just that kind of pastor. I'm a full-service pastor. I would be a very full full service pastor at the end of the season, but uh, enjoy those moments as you sit around the table together and, and reflect on all that he's done and all that he is, okay? And mentioning the music, uh, we're going to be filling our services, obviously, with uh, the songs of the season. Man, Silent Night, that was a gorgeous version of Silent Night. Thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. So let's uh, give the Lord our attention now and let's listen. The words are going to be up there. And if you want to sing along with Shannon, that's why the words are there. It's on her worship album because this is, is really a congregational song. But let's sing with Emmanuel, okay? Go for it, Shannon. Thank you. 
It was, uh, oh man, I, I don't remember. Sometime this last year I was driving around and I hear this song on K-Wave and I'm, it's that song and I'm thinking, wow, that song sounds so familiar and that voice, that voice, that's my daughter. And I just, uh, it took me by surprise. I can't get enough of that. How are you doing? Are you ready for the real Christmas? Tell somebody beside you, I'm ready for the real Christmas. Go ahead. Let's talk about that, all right? Open your Bible, please, to, uh, to John. The Gospel of John, part one in the presence is face to face. If you'd stand with me, let's uh, open our Bibles to John chapter one. Mark your Bible in Psalm 27 as well. But we'll start this morning in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Follow along with me. I'll have you jump in at two places. And John starts his story just like the Bible starts. In the beginning. In the beginning. It says, in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John gives us a little more insight into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working there together. It says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In him, that's in this word, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. And this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That, speaking of the word, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Read verse 12 with me. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14 together. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then John says, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In verse 18, and then we'll finish. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Father, we thank You. Thank You for the story that, that begins at the beginning of time. Thank You for the gift of Your Son, Jesus, the Word that became flesh. Thank you for your presence. God, may our hearts be open today to what you want to say to us through your word. God, I pray that during this, this season, this December, as we look closely again at your presence among us in the person of your son, that we would emerge from this season different for the rest of our lives. We would understand something, Lord, that would now never leave us, that we would cling to as long as we live. In the strong name of Jesus, please teach us. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. So we start what we call our Advent season. Advent is that opening season of the Christian liturgical calendar. How many of you have never heard the word liturgical before? Anybody wonder what that might mean? You didn't grow up in a church like I grew up in. If you grew up in a church where you had kind of this set religious calendar around the, the year, that was the liturgical calendar which would lead you into certain kinds of celebration, not just at Christmas and Easter, but throughout the year. Your story, the Christian story, was told in certain kinds of celebration focuses all throughout the year. But the liturgical calendar, the church calendar, doesn't start 
on January 1st. It starts here as we celebrate the, the promised coming of Messiah. As we look forward, how many of you grew up in a family where you, you lit an Advent wreath? You lit the candles on the Advent wreath, one every week as you moved towards, was it the purple candle that was the last one or the pink one? I don't remember, but there were three of one color and one of another. And all of that was anticipating the arrival of Jesus. The word Advent, in fact, look at it up here on the, on the screen. Advent just means arrival or to arrive, or to appear. It's the dawn of something. It's the birth of someone. The advent of Jesus, the advent season is all about his arrival, his appearance, his birth, his arrival here on planet earth. And it's a season that is, that is certainly worth celebrating. But the point of it all is this, that our story begins right here with his presence, with his arrival. And I want to say this to you about presence. We're going to talk about that for the, the whole month, really. His presence, the presence of Jesus, the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit in your life. We're going to sing about that at the close of the service. His presence is what you want. Uh, if, if, if you were to tell me what you want, what you really, really want, not to quote the Spice Girls, but what you really, really want, <laughs> once you get over all this shallowness of, well, I want more money, or I want more stuff, or I want more power, or I want prestige. What you really want down at the core of your life is everything that's wrapped up and packed in to the presence of God in your life. That's what you really want. Whether you know it or not, that's what all of us want. We want His presence. When you get past all this, this veneer stuff that just really, in the long run, it just really doesn't matter. You were born to be inhabited by the presence of God, by the very God Himself. And the story, this Advent story, begins by telling us good news. He's here. He has come. Emmanuel, he is with us. It says, he dwelt among us. I love the mysterious way John starts his gospel. In the beginning was the word. Where, where did that come from? Where do you get the idea of the word? Well, there is a, a place where he got that, but I can't find that anywhere else in the text. He says, in the beginning was the word, and that word was with God, and the word was God, and he just has you on the edge of your seat. John, who's this word? And he says, well, this word, he does all kinds of things, but here's what he does. Eventually, he takes on flesh. The word became flesh. And he came here, the one who was the creator, the one that was his outrageous giver. Here he was among us. I love the way that John starts the biography of Jesus by saying he dwelt here, he moved here, he lived here among us and we got to see his glory and he defines the glory of God this way. He was full of grace, he was full of truth. Those are the two things we all need. We need wisdom, we need truth, they know how to, we, need, we need clues on how to get through this life. That's the truth of God far beyond just trite little cues or clues. It's everything he said, all the truth that he spoke, and all the grace that's wrapped up in his presence. That's what you've been after your whole life. If you haven't received that yet, if you're still lacking that in your life, then you haven't received Jesus because he brings that truth, that truth. And he comes with that grace that will absolutely, radically transform your life. But I love the way when John tells a story, he skips for some reason. He knew the story. But he skips all the Bethlehem bits. Did you notice that? He says nothing about a baby wrapped in rags laying in a manger. He says nothing about shepherds that have the daylight scared out of them in the middle of the night by an angel. He says nothing about these, these magi on camels or whatever they rode coming from so far away. He goes far before that. He says at the beginning of time, in the beginning, it was God. It was the Word moving, creating everything that we see. John tells us that Jesus was there long before he showed up here and he was giving all the time. I want you to look up here on the screen. We're going to look at the gift registry. And this is just the registry of the gifts that Jesus was giving, that the Word of God was giving to us long before he showed up on this planet. You saw it there in verse 2. Creation, everything you see, everything that you see had its source in the Word of God. Everything that was made was made by Him and nothing was made without Him. All things were created by Him. He gave you that. Every time you look down at a half full plate of food, if that's all you've got, that was a gift from God to you. 
Every time you look at a beautiful forest and you stand by the ocean and you look at your, your loved ones, those are gifts from God to you. Every time you look up at those stars, it should, it should knock us out every time we look up. And it, it should always make us say, whoa, God, you know what? He did that for you. He created all of that for you. He was a creator. All of creation he gave to you. Life he gave to you. In verse 4 it says, In him was life and that life was the light of men. He, he's the one who is, is life and gives light to all men. I love that fact that it says, He gives light to everyone who comes into the world. That life and that light, it's, it's all him and it's all a gift from him. Listen, the life issue is this. You are not just a critter. You're not just a, a, a more exquisitely evolved piece of, of, of the animal kingdom. Because when God created man, it says he breathed into him and he became a living soul. There was something different about man instantly than the dogs and the dinosaurs and the, and the birds and, and everything else that he made. You are unique. That gift of life was given to you by him. That consciousness that you're alive and that thing in you that makes you at some point look up and say, where are you? God, where are you? You've heard the story of Helen Keller, right? You know, this woman that had none of the senses that you have and that you depend on every day. And Ann Sullivan, I think it was Ann Sullivan, when she told her the story of Jesus, or whoever it was that told Helen Keller about Jesus, and they signed it into the palm of her hand and told her about the love of God and that he'd sent his son. You know what she said back? She said, in sign, so that's his name. She said, I'd always known him. I didn't know his name. That was revealed to her. The light that came on in her darkness and in her silence was the God who loved her and loved her and pursued her, the illumination. And you with your senses, don't miss the obvious. You were made by a God who loves you and wants you and pursues you, draws you to himself. All of that is the gift registry that Jesus was giving to every one of us long before he ever showed up here. Then, for real, he came in flesh and he dwelt here and John says God came here and he didn't just come for a quick flyby and then a visit and run back to heaven it says he dwelt here the word became flesh and he stuck around for a while how long 33 point something years he lived here among us right over there in Israel where I've been walking around and swimming around <laughs> right over there in Bethlehem and right over there in Egypt and, and, and up the track in Galilee to Nazareth, moved down to Capernaum, he dwelt here. He was among us and he continued to give. God made himself visible in Christ. When Jesus shows up on planet earth, you get to look now into the eyes of God. You get to see God in a different way. God came here and he lived among us and everything changed for one reason. What was the name of the song we sang? Emmanuel, because God was here. God was here not to visit, but to change, to change your life and to change my life, to change our destiny. He came visibly here among us. God showed up. Not, not like one of those goofy transformers that, you know, they hide on the dark side of the moon and they come out to make things right on earth. Not like the, the crazy titans of, of Greek mythology. This is God who came down and became just like us. And he looked, I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious to you or disrespectful, but Jesus became a guy. He just became another guy. He looked like just another guy on the street. Just another little Jewish boy growing up in a neighborhood in Nazareth. He moved, in, if, if you had lived in Nazareth, he might have lived right next door to you and you would have looked right past him and never thought for a moment, you know, as you saw him, let's say you're walking by his, his carpenter shop when he's 20 years old, 25 years old, and you say, hey, Yeshua, hey, Jesus. Oh, wow, you're looking more like God every day, Yeshua. <laughs> You would never have guessed that that was God in the flesh making a chair or fixing a bench or framing in the windows in your home because he just, he just looked like a guy. But this was far more than a guy. Far more than just another guy. This was God in flesh. Look up here on the screen. Read these with me. In Colossians 1.15, let's read this together. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You know that's what you're looking at when you looked at Christ. 
Oh, could, what an amazing privilege to have been Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, those guys, to look at him and then years later to realize, wow, how did we miss who he really, really was? Look at the second chapter of Colossians, verse 9. Let's read that together. In Christ, the fullness of God lived in a human body. Here's a few more verses in Hebrews. It says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. Well, of course, of course he was heir of all things, the son of the father through whom he also made the worlds. Now here's where it gets personal for you and for me. Who being the brightness of his glory and the exact or the express image of his person. Jesus, who was the brightness of the image of God, the glory of God in him, the exact representation of the Father, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged us from our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, you know what that means? When he was done here, he moved back home. And he sat right back down in the throne that he had vacated to come here and save you. The one who looked exactly like the Father. Do you remember the story when Jesus has, has told his disciples, I've got to go? And they argue with him about it. Of course you would too. You didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want him to go away. You don't want your teenager to go away for two days. You wouldn't want Jesus Christ to go away. The one that you've begun to love so much. And he's answered all those big, big issues in your soul and in your heart. So they argue with him. No, you can't go. Where are you going? We want to go. You can't go. Well, I got to go. I want to go with you. And here's what, what Philip said to him. Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father. If you're leaving, okay, you're leaving. But before you leave, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Pretty big request, isn't it? Let us see what no one else has ever seen. We just want to see God, then you can go. And Jesus' reply was amazing. Philip, don't you even yet know who I am? Even after all the time I've been with you, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He was the fullness of God in a human body. How did God pull that off? It's remarkable he did it, but he did it. Jesus was fully God, fully man, all of God packed down into one guy. Not overpacked, not underpacked. Everything he needs. How many of you love to travel? Love to go on trips? How many of you hate to pack? I love to travel, hate to pack, and, and even though I'm, I, I rarely get packed much earlier than about two hours before I'm ready to go fly. How many of you are like me? It's like last minute, throw it in there, and I'm lugging these suitcases, and, and I'm, I'm determined to, to do carry-on luggage only. I don't want to trust my bags to anybody. If I can help it, I don't pack anything but one roller bag and, and one briefcase sort of backpack. And they always feel like I'm carrying a mountain onto that plane with me. And I typically overpack some things and underpack the things that I really need. Anybody else do that? And you got to send stuff out to the laundry, go buy another pair of jeans. Or I had to buy shoes when I got there. Now I had shoes on my feet, but I had to go buy the shoes that I had to wear for the conferences and I left them behind for somebody else to wear. Joy just said, you what? Yes, that's exactly what I did. I forgot to tell you about that. Yeah, well, that's what I did. <laughs> um, some things in a pastor's life, the pastor's wife finds out when the congregation finds out. Every now and then, that's how that happens, but not the big stuff. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, fully God, packed perfectly into one. Nothing overpacked and nothing underpacked. Everything that he needed to be, he was. And then he came for real right here. He shows up right here on our doorstep, ready to do what he has come to do. And what did he do? He did what he'd done before he came. He gave and he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave. He came loaded, not to make him sound like Santa Claus flying around in the sled, but he came loaded with presents, loaded with gifts. He came loaded with everything that all of us needed. He paid attention to as he walked through this broken world full of broken people. Do you remember? I mean, I remind you of this probably six or seven times a year. What Jesus said he came to do when he stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And here's what I'm here to do. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, let the oppressed go free, open prison doors, recovery of sight to the blind. Take those who have been oppressed and unoppress them. Uncrush those who have been crushed. And he did it. 
throughout his life as Jesus. You follow him in the Gospels. This is all Jesus did. He responded to the people that were right in the middle of his road. He would encounter people whose lives were just absolutely pummeled by the experiences of life and, and by their own wretched decisions. He paid attention to the needs of broken people. He forgave guilty people. He touched confused and tormented people. All those people that were right in the middle of his road. But notice verse 10 and 11 and 12 one more time. It says this about him. There was a catch to all of this. Who got touched by him? It says in verse 10, he was in the world. And the world was made through him. You know what that means? He was the undercover boss in the world. This was his deal. This world was his deal. He made it. He owned it. All of it and all the people. He came like an undercover boss and he says he came to the world. The world was made by him and the world didn't know him. They looked right past him. The whole world. He came in incognito in a sense. Surprisingly human. And then it says in verse 11, not just that, he moved in closer to one group of people. Israel. The Jewish people. He said, but he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Now there were some who did embrace him. And there were some Gentiles who did come after him, but by and large, Jesus was rejected across the boards, except for a small handful of people. Where did they come in? Verse 12, look at it, this is you. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. It was all about responding to his presence. And when I look at the story of Jesus, as, it, as I see it in all four Gospels, I can't think of one part of his story, or one encounter with someone. I can't find one single story where Jesus sent a miracle to someone by airmail because they were too busy to be present. He only touched those who were right there in his path. He didn't stand at the edge of all these little towns and villages and cast out a general blessing. Oh, Father, save all of these people and, and heal all of those sicknesses. But the ones who came to him, who asked for his touch, he didn't turn them away. He gave them what they needed and many times far more than they'd asked for. It's just how he worked. They were the people that were there in the middle of his road. They came and they worshipped him. You listen to him in the story. They plead with him. They beg. They cry out to him from across crowded streets. Those two blind men while everyone's walking by, Hey, Jesus! And they've got to scream to be heard above the crowd. Have mercy on us! And he stops and he says, Bring those two guys here. <laughs> the same guys who were trying to quiet them down. Shh, it's the master. That's Jesus, the master, Messiah. Would you show some respect? And Jesus says, Bring those two guys here. They say, Oh, yes, Lord. We'll bring them right to you. <laughs> And he heals them. Those who were right there in the middle of his road. Those who sought his presence. To the ones who responded. To the ones who were present. <laughs> how many of you can remember, it's going to be hard, but how many of you can remember elementary school? Can you remember, can you remember roll call? Here's how at least half of my teachers insisted that you answer roll call. Now it would be Billy Welsh was almost always last. You know, W, you always end up towards the end of the line. Billy Welsh. And then it was, I would be, I couldn't say, if I said here, it said, excuse me, present. And so it was present. And I didn't really mean it because I wasn't really totally present, but I was present. I always wondered why they had to do roll call. I mean, all the year through. I mean, I can understand the first month while they get to know you, but all year long. Don't you know I'm here? The, the seat, you know, just, just count the empty seats. And he, but there I was, little Billy, and I mean little Billy. I was a really short kid, and, so I, and I always sat as far away from the teacher as I possibly could, back in the back to hide behind the big guys and to, to cheat. Yes, I was a cheater. I was a terrible kid. But uh, don't you ever do that. But yes, I did. But, you know, to, to hide and to goof off and to daydream and to write notes and all that. There really should have been two or three more roll calls throughout the day. Like, Billy Welsh, are you still present? Are you still here? No, I'm not. Because my mind was always off on something else. Whenever I said present, it was only true in word. And there was, I always got this from my teachers. Billy, Billy, you need to play 
You need to pay close attention. Billy, pay attention. And I'd, I'd come up with the, teacher, I don't understand. Miss Reynolds, what do I, I don't understand this. Well, Billy, if you would paid attention, you'd know exactly what to do because Billy didn't pay attention. Because Billy has a problem with paying attention. How many of you know what I mean? Yeah. But I want to encourage, I want to encourage us and, and myself too to approach this season that we're in on our calendar, this Advent season, with a new sense of presence. So let, let's step into his presence, but, but truly be present. In other words, to pay attention, not just to the preachers up here, and there'll be more than me throughout this month, not just to the preachers, but to pay attention during this season, this purposeful season where we slow down and we look again at how this whole thing began when he moved in here among us. Now, pay attention. You notice that phrase? It tells you this is going to cost you something. Pay is going to cost you something. You need to dig down into, you know, your, your attention pocket and pull out some attention and pay some attention to the story and pay attention to his presence because he is present. When, when I look at the first story, when I look at the, the Matthew and the Luke bits of the story, the Bethlehem bits, there were a lot of people that were not paying attention. In fact, most of the world wasn't paying attention. And anyone who did pay attention, anyone who, who, who did see what was happening, you know how they saw? They had lots of help. Every single one of them had assistance. There's, there's Mary and Joseph. An angel shows up and tells them, something remarkable is going to happen to you, Mary. And Joseph, you need to walk along with her through this. And in a dream or, or an angel or a star that's moving, everyone's invited onto the stage and into the scene and everybody else seems to have missed it. The Magi didn't know except for that star that strangely guided them. The shepherds would have still been out in the field if the angels hadn't, hadn't, hadn't scared the daylights out of them that night. And they came and they were present. And they got lined up with the presence of God. And even, even little, little John the Baptist... You know, Zacharias has an encounter with an angel in the temple. He goes home and his wife just has to believe the story until one day Mary, who has Jesus in her womb, walks into Elizabeth's room where she has little John the Baptist in her womb. So two babies in two wombs in one room. And, and when Jesus comes into the room, the baby in the... It's just getting confusing. The baby in Elizabeth's womb starts turning cartwheels. And it's that tip to her that, oh my goodness... The mother of my Lord just walked into my living room. And they had assistance for that. But when they heard, they all came face to face into that presence. And I want you to think for just a few moments with me about that word presence. A couple of verses up here on the screen. And then we're going to turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 16 in the New Living Translation reads like this. Would you read it with me? It says, you will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. Now, the New King James puts it like this. In your presence, you'll show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. In his presence, there's joy. In his presence, I love the way this puts it, the pleasure of living with you forever. There's pleasure evermore. I couldn't be more pleased than the fact that I get to live with you. That's in the presence of God forever. Look at this one. First Chronicles 16, 27. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. I want to be in the place where there's strength, where there's that majesty of God and that honor and that joy. All of those and so much more is wrapped up in the presence, what it means to be in the presence of God. Now, I want you to see the word presence up here. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm thankful for people who are, who write very readable books that sort of unpack all of this for us. The word presence in Hebrew is panim. Say that with me. Panim. Pretty easy. Panim. I want to look it up to see other ways that it's translated. A lot of times, one Hebrew word can be translated into English two or three or four different ways. This one shows up in at least three different ways. And check this out. Panim is translated person, presence, and face. Most commonly, person, presence, and face. One of the first places it shows up as face is God having an encounter with Moses. 
down there in the Negev, down there in the desert. And they're, they're talking through some things and God has a plan for Moses, something he wants him to do. And so there's some questions back and forth and, and Moses is saying, I want to see your glory. Let me see your glory. And God says, no one can see my panim, my face, and live. No one can see the fullness of my glory and live. But he says this about Moses. He said, Moses, you and I are going to meet each other panim to panim, face to face, person to person, presence to presence. And it shows up over and over and over again through that 33rd chapter of Exodus. Moses face to face with the glory of God. God looking him in his face. And, and you know what happens. He, he begins to glow. He's looking at the glory and the bright light of God. And it somehow saturates the skin on his face and his, and his hair and his beard. And he comes down the mountain and he's beaming like a lava lamp. I mean, he's just bright. And, and the people say, put a curtain on that, Moses. And so he has to cover it to protect them. But every time he goes back up to the mountain, the light is there again. The presence of God and the glory of God in his presence like that. Just such a remarkable thing. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 4, and verses 5 through 6. Paul says this, You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, and he goes all the way back to Genesis, God who said, Let there be light in the darkness, has made that light or this light shine in your hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. His presence. He's here. He's among us. He was there physically, but he's still here among us. And what he calls us to is into his presence. Face to face. Can you imagine if, if, if we started our service like this and I said, stand with me. And I have a few things that I want to say to you today. We're going to read from the Gospel of John. Can you imagine us not coming face to face in a time like this? When you come into a room with a loved one, do you want to see their back? You want to see the back of their head? You know, when, when we come before God, you know what I'm after? His face, His presence. I, I want everything that He is, as much as He can fit into me as I am now, I want that packed down into me. And then I made this discovery this week. And it was simple. You know, that stuff starts swimming around in your head and thinking, oh, I've seen the word face there and I've seen the word face there and here. And I say this to you almost every week. Let's read it together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that, in that verse, there are two words Behind them is the Hebrew word panim. Can you guess which ones they are? Face and what? And countenance. It's the same exact word. I don't know why they didn't translate the Lord lift up his face upon you. That might sound a little strange. But his countenance, the brightness of his countenance. So when I say to you as we're leaving, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. That means all that he really is. It takes us back quickly though so we can wrap up here, to Bethlehem. And that's where we're going to be for a few weeks. We're going to be looking at the Bethlehem bits of the story. We're going to look at all these different characters, and it deserves our attention. It deserves some face time, like Moses had face time with his God, and God wants face time with you. It deserves that face time. And it's time for, for little Billy to pay attention. And, and to look closely at this story, to pause and look maybe deeper and allow God to show us things maybe that we haven't seen before, to draw us closer into his presence. You draw near to God, what? He'll draw near to you, and you'll see his face. You'll see that glory. I don't know how that will appear to you. I'm not talking about physical apparitions, but something substantial about the grace and the peace and the overflowing joy and the strength of the Lord and the majesty of God in our life. So that we come through this time and it's not just about the joy of the season. No. It's about the joy of the soul. It's about your soul, your heart, my heart. Trust me, I struggle for this. My heart to be overflowing with His joy. 
If in his presence, I can't tell you how many times recently I've, I've thought about that verse, in his presence is fullness of joy. I thought, Lord, I want that. I want an overflow of that joy, a fullness of it. I don't want to succumb to the pressures and, and the blues of this life. Anybody with me on that? God, I want the fullness of your joy in my life. Let me tell you something. I'm convinced. It will require face time with God. It will require stopping something else, even if it's just 15 minutes, and getting face time, alone time, presence time, person to person with the God who made you for himself. In his presence, he lives in you. He loves you. He called you out of darkness to himself. He dwells in you. And the fullness of that joy and that peace and that strength, that's what he wants. God created you for himself to enjoy that presence forever. So let's pay attention this Advent. Amen? I told you one more. 27. Psalm 27. <laughs> this, you know, we, we've put a pause on our study of David's life, so we might as well let him say something here this morning. He says, The, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. He knew that strength was in the presence of God as well. He said, so of whom shall I be afraid? Look over to verse 4. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Verse 8. I love this. When you said, seek my face, Matanim, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. So what if God says to you, and he does, seek my face, seek my face, what do you say back? Lord, I will. Lord, your face I will seek. It'll cost you, it'll cost me. It's what, what, what we like to call devotions. Devotions can be that thing you got, oh, I've got to read my chapters, okay, blah, 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 got it done, got to go. Is that FaceTime? It's lingering as long as you can and paying attention. And giving him time to do something, that quiet time, whatever you want to call it. Give him some FaceTime. Get close to him. Now, first things first. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are searching those, for those who will seek his face, those who will trust him. His eyes, his face, he's looking for you. And if you haven't yet surrendered to him, now is your opportunity right now today, this moment, to give God face time. Don't turn your back to him. Don't side glance him. Look him square in the face and you'll find what you're after, forgiveness and grace and truth. You'll find the joy. You'll find the peace. You'll find the purpose. You'll find a guide. All of that I could go on, but we're out of time. You'll find him. You'll find what you were made for. I want to ask you to pray with me. The worship team is going to come back up. But if you haven't received him, now is the time to give in and humbly and confidently, attentively, and even desperately come and say, Jesus, here I am. Now, I'm going to pray, like I said, but not just for you, with you. I want to pray with you. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And here's what it's basically going to be about. God, I open my life to you. I turn my face to you. I will give you my attention. That's a big order for me to give my full attention to anything, but God deserves it. So I'm going to endeavor to do that. And we're going to pray that way and just make a fresh surrender of our life to him and to seek his presence. Amen? I mean, look, look if, if you're looking for peace and happiness apart from him, it doesn't exist. You won't find it anywhere but in him. So come right now. And let's pray. Let's pray like this. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus who came from heaven to earth to die for my sins and to save me. Please forgive me. Come live in my heart. Take over my life. I turn my face to you, Lord. I will seek your face. Fill me with all that you are and use me for your glory. In the strong name of Jesus, my life is yours. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Father in heaven.
Lord, I pray your blessing, your outrageously overwhelming blessing, Lord, upon your people, Lord, as we seek your face together, as we seek you for our own lives, our families, and for our church, Lord. Would you take us deeper? Would you help us to reach further, Lord? Would you help us to do as much as we can do for your glory in this land at this time? In Jesus' name. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.